and he will be talking about let's see. Dick Clark will be talking about human rights versus real politique. And Dick Clark, of course, is our former senator from Iowa. But now I'd like to introduce Dr. Raymond Hutchings. Dr. Raymond Hutchings is a student of Soviet affairs. He got his BA and MA from Cambridge and his PhD from London University. During 1957 to 1959, he was the second secretary of the British Embassy over in Moscow. And he has taught at several universities here in the United States, University of Texas being the last one. He is currently on his 11th lecture tour here in the United States. He is an expert on the Soviet Navy, and he has just given at 1 o'clock a speech to the midshipmen here at Iowa State University. This is the first time he has spoken in Iowa. This is the second lecture here today. So will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Raymond Hutchings. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, as uh, Mark Aaron just remarked, I can't claim that this is the first talk I've given in Iowa since one was given two hours ago. Uh, but at any rate, it's the second, and I'm delighted to uh, add Iowa to the list of states where I've given talks in the United States. Uh, counting the District of Columbia list, list has now risen to 17, so I've got sort of ways to go before reaching the um, target of uh, 50. Well, um, I have to deal with a very big subject today, and I'm going to plunge uh, straight into it. It's uh, the official title is Western Petroleum Supplies, National Policies and Strategic vulnerabilities. Uh, we're going to traverse a whole range of um, aspects of the problem, uh, both the general oil supply situation, the strategic uh, question, what can be done to avert uh, or overcome possible shortages and difficulties. It's one of the most critical and chronic problems underlying international affairs and the future of the world economy. Uh, it's an issue that threatens frequently to disturb international relations and may even jeopardize world peace. Now, the background to the problem can be stated um, uh, fairly surely, or not, although not very simply or briefly. Uh, the foreground changes almost from day to day, and therefore I hope you're not asking me to make short-range predictions. Uh, they are particularly difficult to incorporate in um, a general talk. By petroleum, I mean about oil, oil. Natural gas is often found with oil. In itself, it's an extremely important fuel and one of the growing importance in a number of countries, and uh, especially important here in the US, which has long relied on natural gas um, extensively. But the dynamics of its development and uh, the conditions in which it's uh, are used are rather different from those of oil and would need a separate talk to expound. So I'm going to concentrate, uh, above all, on um, oil. Now, of course, I'm focusing on Western supplies. I don't mean to suggest that supplies to the rest of the world, including the Eastern Bloc, the Third World, are unimportant or unworthy of attention. Uh, but the Third World may get its due treatment uh, later or perhaps has um, already done so. It's arguable, too, that certain Western countries, um, including the United States, uh, perhaps the West as a whole, makes excessive demands on global petroleum supplies, though that is, too, not a simple question to resolve, and I shall allude again to that when speaking about possible economies. Uh, when discussing international affairs, it's wise to try to put the matters in a historical context, which I shall seek to do, and also in a general economic perspective and later uh, in a strategic one. Petroleum is used, of course, for a number of purposes, uh, including lubrication, um, but above all, it's a branch of energy supplies. It's also raw material, which normally needs to be refined into various uh, grades for uh, specific purposes, gasoline, high-octane fuel for aircraft, and so on. Uh, so to produce usable grades of petroleum demands uh, an enormous 
investment. However, I'm not going to talk about that uh, today. I'm going to assume that this manufacturing, refining capacity is available. Uh, well, concern with the availability of raw materials um, goes back, I suppose, as far as history itself. Even in ancient times, trade routes stretched over considerable distances, exceptional circumstances, they were subject to interruption. The um, old city of Novgorod in northern Russia, which has been excavated lately, is found underneath the medieval ruins of often walnut shells. They're not grown locally. These came from what we now call the Middle East and uh, the Balkans. But when the Mongol invasions swept across southern Russia in the 13th century, the trade was interrupted. And so we don't find walnut shells in the layers of excavation later from that point, too much later. But to make the jump to modern times, Concern with the availability of raw materials has been, in normal circumstances, um, de a development only of comparatively recent times. This concern belongs um, essentially to the past 10 years. Industrial revolutions, advances in living standards have always required sufficient quantities of materials, which um, could be processed with contemporary techniques. This is the uh, point uh, to note here and that they should be to hand at prices that purchasers were willing and able to pay. That applies to the whole range of materials, of course, iron ore, bauxite, phosphate, cement, coal, oil, natural gas, and the other things. And there have been shortages in wartime, which Europeans um, certainly will, um, including myself, remember. Uh, but um, in peacetime, until quite recently, most raw materials have been available in adequate uh, supply, and frequently in surplus. And correspondingly, except from the standpoint of cer certain specific countries like Nazi Germany when preparing for uh, envisaging uh, an, an economy uh, in wartime situation, economists didn't pay a great deal of attention to availability of raw materials as a factor in economic growth. The situation of Japan, which lacks virtually all raw materials, uh, including oil, but which nevertheless has achieved since 1945 a phenomenal economic growth, was often cited in that connection. Similarly, the countries that imported raw materials were in many cases, uh, that exported raw materials, were in many cases developing countries uh, where living standards and general economic levels were far below those of the importing countries. So apparently to export raw materials was inherently less profitable than to import them. Uh, it was more profitable, it seemed, to export manufactured goods, and this became virtually a dogma in a number of countries, notably within the Soviet bloc. Uh, for instance, you can hear this viewpoint echoed today in Bulgaria. Now, it's certainly not necessary for a country to possess its own raw materials, provided that it can obtain them reliably and not too expensively from outside. No country today is self-sufficient or anywhere near it, even the USSR, which is on the whole the most self-sufficient country, uh, is not. Certainly not the United States, which has, from many points of view, the claim to be regarded as the second best endowed. It remains true that a skilled, highly organized, uh, technically advanced country can transform materials into finished products that are vastly more valuable, weight for weight, than the materials used to produce them. Uh, but uh, whether raw materials can now be attained uh, can now be uh, got, gotten reliably and not too expensively has become a critical question. While nations such as Japan were demonstrating that they could do very well without indigenous raw materials, some other countries were providing less spectacular illustrations that such endowments could prove very useful. South Africa and Australia have been two of these. It's far from accidental that South Africa, which has on an average much the highest living standard of living in, uh, standard of living in Africa. is also the world's principal supply of gold and diamonds, uh, and also an important supply of many other minerals. Or that Australia first rode to prosperity, uh, as one may say, on the sheep's back, and uh, now is an important export of iron ore and uranium, among other minerals. My own country, Britain, is benefiting at this moment from uh, the bonanza of North Sea oil and gas. This will not solve all our problems, but it certainly helps compared with uh, a decade ago. 
Compared with a decade ago, the situation of individual Western countries has improved from the angle of self-sufficiency in oil. Britain is one of these, though not from the angle of retail prices, uh, by the way. Gasoline is about twice as expensive in Britain as it is in the US today. Uh, but on the whole, the situation of Western countries and prominently among them now the United States has sharply worsened. Now, why is that? Uh, well, the raw material resources of the world are immense, but finite. And no doubt if everything could be extracted from the oceans and the Earth's crust, or perhaps below the crust, human needs could be satisfied for an extremely long time. But it must be practicable to extract them with available technologies at an economic cost, and that imposes much narrower limits. What's relevant at any one moment is the ratio of reserves to the rate of um, extraction. If that ratio falls too low, conservation of the resources, that is stretching them out over a longer period of time, is bound to emerge as an overriding goal. Because, of course, no country wishes to be placed suddenly in a position where its uh, raw material resources are totally exhausted leaving it without uh, such physical uh, assets for the foreseeable future. Uh, but um, long before that point is reached, if depletion of reserves emerges as a likely result uh, within a foreseeable time, then the response is almost certain to be to reduce the rate of extraction so that uh, even if the evil day can't be put off forever, at any rate it can be put off and um, perhaps um, uh, transferred to the concern of future generations. Uh, now, it's important to realize that if depletion is looming ahead, even a large rise in the unit price you get for the product will not necessarily persuade the producer to step up the rate of output, and it may very well do the contrary. Normally, it's assumed in economics that we have um, you know, what the economists call a forward-sloping supply curve. That's to say a higher unit price will evoke um, a bigger supply. Well, it's admitted that in some circumstances this will not be the case. Uh, typically, for instance, where work is extremely arduous uh, or unpleasant to pay the worker a higher rate per hour uh, may not mean that he works more hours, but most likely that he works fewer hours. He can satisfy his needs in a shorter time. And that's the case of the so-called backward-sloping supply curve. And uh, another instance of that is possible, um, uh, imagine, imaginable exhaustion of the reserves of a country in the foreseeable future. For then, the producing country can meet its present needs and still stretch out its reserves over a longer time if you offer it a higher price. Uh, well, depletion eventually will be the fate of all non-renewable resources, even the so-called non-renewable ones, uh, indeed, like solar energy will give out eventually, though we will... Um, most likely not be around to see it, having uh, perhaps long ago migrated elsewhere in the uh, universe or rather uh, long since descendants. Other resources have been depleted over a longer period, uh, so that uh, although within the last few thousand years uh, they have been uh, in to a great degree uh, reduced in quantity and there's no popular memory of that happening. However, uh, Europe and the Middle East used to be far more forested uh, than they are now, the rate at which forests are currently being um, depleted will not allow them to survive the next century, as I dare say the movie this morning, which I didn't see, may have illustrated. So the problem of the eventual depletion of petroleum supplies is merely a problem which is common to all raw, material, raw materials uh, and fossil fuels. So what's special about today's situation and why is it justifiable to regard oil as a special case? Well, the reason is because of the recent and very unfavorable trend of discovery in relation to extraction. Now, um, people have cried wolf before when it looked as if oil supplies were going to be depleted and they were proved wrong because fresh discoveries came along and uh, so the evil day was postponed. It seemed reasonable to expect that this would go on happening. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility that well, that will happen again. Uh, very large deposits will again be discovered and uh, will again banish the fear of depletion of supplies to uh, the remote future. But at the moment this looks very unlikely. 
Let's consider what's happening to the rate of discovery. Oil is produced today in many countries, but the distribution is very markedly skewed. A few countries are responsible for the great bulk of production. The largest producers in order, the first three are the USSR, United States, and um, Saudi Arabia. Well, just stating the problem like that, you immediately see that the problem involves east-west relations and also the third world. As regards consuming countries, these include everyone, though, of course, in extremely different amounts. Uh, with such a complicated picture, it would seem very difficult to get it into focus. However, fortunately, it's been shown that a clear enough picture can be obtained if one concentrates on major oil fields, leaving out of account the uh, numerous smaller ones. According to a survey by Richard Nehring of the Iran Corporation, which also is cited in some other places like uh, the World Oil Market in the Years Ahead by the National Foreign Assessment Center, you can focus attention on um, the so-called giant and supergiant oil fields. Uh, and that means as following, uh, as follows, classification giant means that total recovery is more than 500 million barrels. Uh, Supergiant, the total recovery is more than 5 billion barrels, that's to say 10 times as much. Now, a barrel is about 1 cent seventh of a metric ton, and the meaning of recovery is what you have extracted already plus what you expect to be able to extract in the future, the total amount of oil you can um, get out. Uh, so looking simply at the giant and supergiant fields, there's a big range of size here too. The largest supergiant field, uh, which is in Saudi Arabia, the Gawar field, is reckoned to have a recovery of 83 billion barrels. Um, in contrast, East Texas, uh, though not small, has only 5.6 billions. The whole Arabian, Iranian region is reckoned to contain about 50% of the entire world's petroleum reserves. By 1970, there were 33 supergiant fields, of which two were situated in the USSR, two in the United States, 11 partly or wholly in Saudi Arabia. Now, the US is slightly an odd man out in this case because it relies to a greater extent than others on non-major oil fields, smaller oil fields, which so we'll slip out of this analysis. However, <coughs> focusing on the supergiants <coughs> and the giants, now they produce altogether about three quarters of the world's oil. Well, as I say, there were 33 in 1970, 33 supergiant fields. Only two have been discovered since then, both of those in or offshore Mexico. Most of the supergiant fields have been known long since, and of course, if they are very big, the likelihood of finding them is greater than that of finding a smaller one. The fact that in the past decade, only two have been found, although drilling is being carried out now in harsher physical environments, at unprecedented depths uh, over um, an even wider geographical range, and with the aid of even more sophisticated investigating scientific techniques is not very encouraging. The dip in the rate of discovery has been sudden uh, and indeed alarming. Examining the rate of discovery from decade to get to decade of giant and supergiant fields and the recoverable oil, that's in billion barrels, to be expected from them, we get the picture which is in the quarter reduction on the last decade. 
That could be an exception, but it's uh, an ominous trend. Uh, true, uh, because of the sharp increase in the price of oil, it's become an economic proposition to prospect in more distant, uh, less hopeful areas. The rate of discovery is likely to rise as a result of this stimulus. Uh, however, the rate of discovery, um, the, the, the likelihood of finding further giant and supergiant fields at a rate sufficient to counterbalance the currently declining ratio of reserves to extraction appears very small. And so in the upshot, oil is likely to become increasingly short. Uh, while that's true of the world as a whole, the impact will be especially strong on the Western powers owing to their high rate of consumption. Although on the other hand, uh, they also have greater possibilities of economizing, if they can mobilize those possibilities, and of uh, inventing substitutes. Uh, one can temporarily exempt certain countries from that picture, such as Britain and Norway, for the time being relying on North Sea oil. But this can bring only short-term relief. Uh, well now, uh, one can set out um, in order the following general problems facing the world's consumers of petroleum, and which are faced by Western nations uh, in proportions that are specific to them individually, uh, but to some extent uh, apply to all of them, uh, as follows. And uh, here I shall relate the um, topic uh, both to economic and to strategic considerations. First, there's a threat of damage or disruption to internal sources of supply. And then there's a threat of withholding supplies from external sources, um, either voluntarily um, by um, decision of those exporting countries or involuntarily owing to disruption or damage caused perhaps by uh, wartime events or owing to the acquisition of control over major sources by hostile powers or their preemption of all available supplies. Kind of large um, category there. And then third, the, um, the naval side, the threat of cutting lanes of communication, um, especially sea lanes, though uh, oil is also transported by other means, like pipelines, which are generally less vulnerable. And finally, there's the threat of um, a rise in prices beyond what consuming countries are able to pay. And in conjunction with that, the impact of national policies, uh, especially conservationist policies. Of course, over a longer period, conservationist policies may be expected to alleviate rather than um, uh, the problem, rather, to, uh, rather than to aggravate it. Well, I'm going to consider all these in turn. Uh, first, the um, threat of damage to internal sources of supply. It hasn't been a prominent worry. It might grow in importance. Uh, we have in mind... Um, sabotage, but mainly wartime um, conditions. In World War II, oil wells were not normally targeted. They were either too remote or too widely scattered to be attractive targets. Refineries were, um, for instance, uh, refineries in Romania were attacked by liberator bombers. Now, since then, oil wells have uh, acquired a, a different um, kind of um, silhouette. Uh, they are found increasingly offshore and in, immense, in uh, immensely valuable and productive installations. Drilling platforms um, uh, of uh, enormous size or transshipment terminals found, for instance, in the North Sea. And these are compact, uh, valu uh, valuable, and rather vulnerable uh, items. Uh, for instance, how to defend the drilling rigs in the North Sea today is um, a lively preoccupation of the British government. It's difficult to see how adequate defense can be achieved. Uh, we often saw, uh, cite Soviet submarines uh, in their vicinity. The threat at any rate in this area is not simply interruption of sea lanes of communication. Uh, secondly, passing over to um, uh, a more actual and um, experienced uh, problem, deliberate withholding of supplies. Of course, first used by OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, in 1973, still retained by them as a potential weapon. While Middle Eastern countries led the way here, conceivably African countries might join them in certain circumstances, though much less readily, owing to their far more urgent need of oil revenues. Nigeria's nationalization of British petroleum on the eve of the Lusaka conference a little more than a year ago might be a straw in some future wind. Up to now, the Israeli-Arab conflict has been the justification or claim justification for imposing such a 
withholding. Uh, but there are other prerequisites too. One has been uh, the growing reliance of Western nations on Middle Eastern, uh, that is of course Arab oil. And the other one has been the hammering together of the effective cartel, um, OPEC. Now, although petroleum shortage will continue to be, uh, as I've suggested, um, uh, a danger, the immediate prospects for wielding the oil weapon again look dim. Although the Israeli, or from our point of view, of course, uh, bright. Uh, while the Israeli-Arab conflict may not have been uh, finally settled by the Treaty with Egypt, at any rate, there shouldn't now be any direct threat to Israel's existence. But the main difficulty in the way of wielding the oil weapon is, of course, that you can only use it uh, or threaten to use it if oil would flow, if not deliberately held up uh, by the country of origin. And uh, the situation at present as a result of the Iraq-Iran war is that petroleum exports have been either halted or sharply cut back from those countries. Of course, even if the interruption of supplies in these circumstances can't be used to enforce concessions from would-be purchasers, that interruption um, has itself certain uh, no less serious economic effects. But in this specific case, these should be less serious than, um, from an economic viewpoint, than those which resulted from the oil blockade of 1973-4, thanks to measures taken in the interim to diversify our supplies or to economize in oil consumption. <coughs> Another difference as compared with 1973-4 is that uh, now Eastern countries are also involved. If, uh, for instance, France was importing oil from Iran, uh, Czechoslovakia was from Iraq. And the longer the war drags on, presumably, the uh, more successful we may be in finding alternative supplies. Could any power hostile to the West contrive to exclude Western customers through buying up the stuff, preemption, or perhaps by concluding agreements with oil producing countries not to supply oil to the West? Uh, well, one's first uh, impulse certainly is to say very unlikely. The most direct and foolproof way to achieve that would be through military occupation of the oil producing regions. Now, it's claimed by some that that was um, the real uh, imagined motivation between the, uh, behind the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Even those who did not see things that way admit that the invasion has brought Soviet forces much nearer to the, the Gulf area. Certainly the Russians will not have omitted to notice that. And according to some um, reports, the biggest concentration of their forces is in the southwest of uh, Afghanistan, nearest to the Gulf. And the fear that the Russians might be tempted to go further was uh, evidently what prompted President Carter to announce that uh, any interference by the USSR with all supplies passing through the Gulf would mean war. Uh, but in my opinion, nearness to the Gulf was not the main reason uh, or the um, originating reason why the Russians invaded Afghanistan. I consider that was uh, originated in other circumstances, notably in the fact uh, that they have a, a large and growing proportion of uh, their own people are Muslims and they do not wish any disaffection from outside to extend and they do not wish any disorders to take place in a country adjacent to theirs from which such disaffection might spread. Uh, now, this of course is not a trivial matter and if every country acted likewise it would justify uh, most of us in invading some other uh, adjacent country. Uh, but I don't think, in this case, the connection is mainly with the oil situation. A national monopoly over any single raw material has been certainly an extremely rare event, and in fact, uh, I haven't been able to think of a single illustration. That's a fairly strong argument against envisaging it as likely, especially as the USSR has an, a very highly developed historical sense. Um, it could perhaps... Um, be uh, imagined as practicable if the raw material in question has no substitutes uh, and is produced in very few places, and uh, particularly if rivals have not been alerted to the potential danger. Well, of course, the last circumstance doesn't apply. We have been uh, visibly alerted to the potential danger. 
And indeed, we were visibly alerted a long time ago. Uh, when in 1956, Hushoff and Bulganin visited Britain, uh, they were told by our then Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, that um, uh, interference with the, um, in this case, with British oil supplies from uh, the Gulf would uh, be met by strong measures. Uh, well, and then I suppose the uh, ill-starred British and French venture in uh, Suez in 1956, uh, to some extent, proved the reality of that concern. On the other hand, uh, since then, Western dependence on Middle Eastern oil has tended to increase. Uh, the temptation, as well as, I suppose, our determination, uh, may also have been strengthened. What we can conclude is that the Russians would not think that they can interrupt the West's supplies from the Gulf by a measure short of war. And that's uh, uh, a somewhat comforting conclusion. Of course, the situation in wartime would be a different matter. And in that case, uh, which uh, embraces uh, obviously a, a whole range of uh, unimaginable situations, a Soviet attempted at occupation of the area would seem to be a real possibility, especially if naval um, interception around the Cape of Good Hope would prove ineffective, uh, to which I'll now turn. Uh, thirdly, to safety of the lines of communication. <coughs> well, this is a very large question. And uh, before looking at it, I'll just make the following asymmetry. The USSR does not rely uh, itself at all on seaborne oil transport. Its oil goes by pipeline uh, in the main. Among Western countries, I'm going to look at the situation of the United States, uh, especially, but I'll also glance at that of others. The US actually is less dependent on Middle Eastern oil than most NATO countries, with the uh, exception now of Britain and Norway. In fact, among major industrial countries, the US has the most diverse sources of supply. And the other extreme with the least diverse sources is uh, Japan. Uh, so uh, we here get um, oil from a number of places. Venezuela is an important supplier for, um, instance, 